So good morning. Um, welcome to the next lecture in Vector Calculus. Today we start a new subsection called Surface Integrals. Okay, so you can think of this subsection as being a natural progression from when we were integrating over curves. Okay? Now we looked at path integrals, line integrals. Here we're going to look at integrals over two dimensions, two dimensional surfaces. Okay? Now, in the lecture, in the previous lecture, we did motivate the subject and we did talk about parameterized surfaces in the so-called curvy linear coordinates. Okay, and that included the coordinate systems that you already know, like cylindrical coordinates, spherical coordinates, and of course rectangular coordinates as well. Now today's lecture is going to be on two things. Firstly, we're going to look at the area of a surface, or surface area, and secondly, we're going to look at surface integrals of scalar-valued functions. So you can think of this lecture as generalizing, in a sense, the lecture on path integrals, when we were integrating scalar-valued functions over curves. And throughout the lecture, you should try to draw analogies um, between the two. Okay? Yes? Yes, a line integral. Line integral of vector fields. So we call that a vector line integral. Technically, you're integrating the dot product of two vectors, but um, we still call it, a, a, well, I call it a vector line integral. Okay? All right, so just to remind, to remind ourselves of where we're going, we're going to learn a surface integral. How and why is it useful? Well, surface area is one application, and another very important application is calculating flux. Now, remember when we were working in the plane, in the xy plane, we talked about the flux of a vector field over, say, a closed surface, okay? Oh, sorry, a closed curve, I beg your pardon, okay? And for that, we could make use of a normal vector, and um, the case for flux over surfaces is just a generalization. All right, so... Last lecture, we talked about parameterizations. Okay, so over here we've got some parameter, parameter domain d of this this vector value function here, and under the the parameterization, the image maps out a surface. Okay, in R3. Now we looked at some special examples and probably the simplest case is when the surface is, is a graph. In that case, we can use this parameterization here and this is your parameter doma uh, domain D and you can see the surface lies above Okay, so here's another example of a cone. In that case, it was cylindrical coordinates. Cylinder. Okay. We also talked about a sphere, and you can, if, if, you're, if you want to see all the details again, you can, of course, see them on, on the web. All right, so don't, don't try to copy this down if you didn't get it in the last lecture. You can see it on the web. Okay, so on to today's material. Now, we're going to make some assumptions about the surfaces that we deal with. Okay, there, there's three key assumptions. The domain of our parameterization is going to be an elementary region in the plane. Okay? Secondly, the components of our parameterization are C1. In other words, the partial derivatives are going to be continuous. All right? 
Um, furthermore, the mapping is going to be one to one, except possibly on the boundary. It's not. It's technically it's not a big deal. And thirdly, the image of my, our parameterization, in other words, the surface is regular. In other words, um, this cross product of tangent vectors, which we talked about last time, is non-zero. Okay. All right. All right, so let's get down to some, some surface area. All right, so suppose we have a parameterization of some surface, and that parameterization has this domain. The area, the surface area of curly S is this double integral here. Okay? Now, in some texts, it's customary to write this n vector for this particular cross product, okay? But be careful here. This, this normal vector n is not necessarily a unit vector, okay? And the tangent vectors are not necessarily unit, tang uh, unit vectors either, okay? When we did, for example, um, uh, line integrals, we had a unit tangent vector involved. Here, it's not necessarily the case. So don't get your, don't get your notation confused here. Okay? All right. So where does, this, where does this theorem come from? How do we arrive at this? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's have a look at it. All right. Now, by now, you should see a pattern. A lot of calculus, especially integration, involves Riemann sums. Okay, to set up those Riemann sums, you slice accordingly, and then you sum accordingly. So, how does it work in this case? Well... We slice up the domain of our parameterization. Okay, now we can make the cuts regular, like the same width. It's not a big deal. And you can see here, I've got one corner of this rectangle. Okay, I've, I've labelled that P dash. All right, so under the mapping, the image of our parameterization maps out some possibly curved surface. Okay? So you can think of this curvy, I guess, curvy rectangle, for want of a better word. This is what this yellow rectangle maps to. Okay? All right. So what we, what we, what, what, what we want to do here is calculate the surface area of this surface. Now, to do that, it's basically two things. We estimate the area of this ye little yellow region by using a parallelogram. Okay, that's all it is. You may sort of look back here and go, hang on, I know this, this cross product and the, the, the magnitude of this cross product. It looks like it looks like the area of a parallelogram. Hmm, okay, so how do we do that? Well, let's zoom in on this yellow bit and the previous yellow bit. Here it is. Okay, so basically this is... what our parameterization maps from and to. 
Now, you can see here, at least in this picture, if you consider the vector PQ and the vector PS, you can form a parallelogram. Right? And what you can do then is look at the area of the parallelogram with these corners here, and that will give you an approximation to the, um, I guess, to the uh, area of SIJ. Okay, so. So the key fact is, We approximate the area by approximating the area of a parallelogram. Okay. All right, so how do we do that? Well, let's think about the vector PQ. Now, PQ is just, of course, vector Q minus vector P. Now, P dash maps to P under our um, parameterization. Q dash maps to Q. So we can write this vector in terms of our parameterization. Okay. Yes, Joel. Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah, you're right. Dash. Thank you. Okay. So these are the. So this is Q dash, P dash. Thanks very much. Okay. So, well, what what does that mean? Well, if we go back to our original picture, P dash is this point here, okay? And the other corner is delta U units to the right of P dash, right? So we can write these two things into a, a little bit more precisely, I guess. So Q dash is u i j plus delta u. Okay. And phi of p dash, well, that's just the following. All right. So now, now we have a difference. I'll get you in a minute. Now, we can use a linear approximation for this difference. Remember your lectures on Taylor polynomials, right? You can approximate this difference using a first-order Taylor polynomial. Now, there's no change in the second variable here, so we're only worried about the change in the first variable, all right? So that's our linear approximation there. Now, if you remember back to how we defined our tangent vectors, it's just this. Our tangent vectors TU and TV. Okay, so we end up with the approximation to the vector PQ is just the tangent vector TU times... Oh, times delta, sorry, delta u. All right, so that's an approximation. Okay, yes? I don't understand what your PQ is. It's the vector from P to Q. 
Would you be more comfortable if I wrote it like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah? Because uh, this, is the, this is the position vector of Q, and this is the position vector of P. I mean, it, it's okay. If, if the notation's unclear, then um, I'm, I'm happy to, to explain it. You, are you with me now? Okay. All right, so... Let's think about the other vector now, PS. Okay? You can go through the same motion and get a first order approximation for the vector um, PS. Right? But I'm not going to do that because I don't want to don't want to bore you too much. Oops, approximately equal to. Oh, TV. Okay, so this is TV times delta V. All right, so now what we can do is return to our little picture and go, all right, I'm going to approximate the area of this curved parallelogram by computing the area of this parallelogram here. Okay, that's where we use the cross product. So, so the area oh, is approximately equal to, sorry. Okay, it's the area of the parallelogram. Which is just the, the magnitude of this cross product, right? And now what we're going to do, we're going to replace vector PQ and vector PS with our approximations. Okay? Now, remember, the, the TU and the TV are vectors. The delta U and the delta V are scalars. We can actually take out the delta U and the delta V. Okay, so now, now what? Well, to gain an approximate... Area for the whole curvy surface, we sum, right? Now there's going to be two in, uh, indices, so there's going to be two summation signs in the limit, all right? So to get to the next part, so the surface. area of, oh, of S okay Okay, so again, it's the slice and sum technique that you know. All right? Okay. So we end up with what we wanted. Yeah. All right. Anyone still going on this one? 
All right, let's do an exercise and see how it all works. Here we're given a parameterization. We are asked to calculate the tangent vectors and this vector n and find the area of this surface, S, where the parameter domain is this rectangle. OK, it's a pretty, pretty straightforward question. No, nothing too tricky about it. But let's, let's investigate it a little further and see, see how we go. All right. So for part A, to calculate the tangent vectors, we just differentiate each component of our parameterization and write it as a, as a new uh, a vector. OK, so differentiate here. You're going to get um, 1, 1, and 3. And TV, well, we just differentiate with respect to V. So that's going to be 0, minus 1, and 1. OK. All right, so to take the cross product, Just the cross product of these two vectors. Now, I'm, I'm not going to do like write that all out because, you know, I, I only have a finite amount of time here. From my calculations, you should get that. Now, notice that in this case, the normal vector is a constant vector. Okay, when when the prob these problems get more difficult it's not necessarily going to be a constant vector. You'll have u's and v's floating around in it. Okay. All right, but on to part b. Part, is the more, uh, part b is the more interesting um, part of this question. Find the surface area where this is the parameter domain. How do we do it? Using the previous theorem, we have the following. So all, we, we've already got the cross product here. All we need to do is take its length. The length is going to be something like um, root 18. Okay. Now, the nice thing here is that with this root 18, of course, you can simplify that, um, you have a constant, so you can pull it out the front. So actually, no integration is necessary to do this problem. Why? Because what's left here is just the area of D, right? It's just the area of D. Now, D is just a rectangle. So it's pretty easy to calculate the area of D, right? So let me just draw in the parameter domain here. Uh, two. Okay. It's not really drawn to scale, but anyway. All right. So we recognize that, hang on. It's just 3 root 2 times the area of D. And the area of D is just 6. All right, so the surface area of our surface is just 18 root 2 square units. All right, now you may think hang on, why, why did I do this cross product and not, why didn't I cross it the other way? And will that affect the answer? 
Who thinks, who thinks it'll affect the answer? Anyone? Well, it won't because all we're interested in here is the magnitude of the cross product. Okay, so it doesn't matter which way you do your cross product for this, um, these type of problems, right? Draw the analogy with um, when we looked at, at path integrals, right? The, pa the path integral, when we parameterized it, it didn't depend on the direction of the tangent vector. It just depended on its, on its length or its magnitude. Okay, so there's a similar... There's, there's a similar type of idea here. Of course, you've got a normal vector here rather than a tangent, but hopefully you get the idea. Any questions so far? All right, so that's a pretty standard question. Now, if you want to um, generalize this a bit, and yes, we do, we can talk about a surface integral now. Okay, we can talk about a surface integral. So... Given some surface and a parameterization, and the parameterization has this domain, this is how we denote the surface integral of a given function f over the surface s. All right? And in fact, in this theorem, we're actually told how to compute it, right? in terms of this parameterization. Now, here I've used two different kinds of notation just to expose you to it. I actually, I'm actually more comfortable with this one, okay, because it's really clear what we mean by this normal vector. Okay, but some texts write it both ways. So you have to be very careful. Am I talking about a unit normal here? Or how, how is that normal constructed? Okay? Especially when you jump from one part, of, one part of a text to another part and they've got the same letters there, which is very, very confusing. Um, sometimes, though, these, these questions are quite long and you don't want to write out all this, so you can actually just boil it down and write out that. But just get a feel for it. Ian? You can, of course you can. Yep, yep, you can. You can write this as DA if you want to. Okay, no problem, no problem. Um, so that's not fixed by any by any means. Okay, the order's definitely not fixed. Good question. Okay. This particular um, integral is useful for calculating the mass of thin shells, thin bowls, thin drums. Okay, so it's just it's basically an extension from our first lecture on calculating the mass of thin plates. Those plates would sit in the xy plane, whereas these are thin shells and, and bowls and metal drums and domes. So yes, they're two-dimensional if, if, if we think of them as th very thin, but they sit in R cubed. Okay? All right, so um, given a density function, delta, mass per unit area, and a shell occupying the surface S, then the mass of the shell is just the surface integral of the density function. Okay? Now, again, this is analogous to what we did with path integrals. Okay? And also analogous to the first lecture we had on double integrals. All right. So... The basic idea here is just to use um, density equals mass over area. All right, so I'm going to refer back to the curvy parallelogram that I put up um, earlier. Okay, so... So Sij is the little curvy parallelogram that Rij is mapped to under the parameterization, right? So if you want to look back, you can look back to the, the pictures there. So the density of Sij, it's approximately equal to the density evaluated at P
uh, sorry, which is equal to the density of the parameterization at P dash. All right. Now, from the previous result, we know how to estimate the area for the rectangle uh, for the um, surf uh, the little surface SIJ. So the area of SIJ is approximately equal to this. Okay, so we did that when we did surface area. All right, so the mass... of Sij is approximately equal to this times this. Okay, just these two things together. Just, just working from this formula up here. Okay? All right, so we have the mass of the little, the little curvy parallelogram, Sij, or at least an approximation for it. What we do now, is, of course, is sum over the indices and we'll form a double integral, right? So the mass of entire surface. Okay, so in the limit... We'll get the following. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, I sort of wrote this the wrong way around, really. There you go, Ian. You happy with that? Happy with that DA there? All right, good. Okay, so you should be seeing a pattern here between this lecture and the previous lectures. I, ho I hope you, you, you're putting it together. Um, you may be sick of, of Riemann sums by the end of this course. I'm, I'm, I apologise for that, if you are. All right. So... Here's a, a nice little table of some of the applications associated with these surface integrals. All right? So we can calculate the mass, first moments, coordinates of the centre of mass. We can also talk about moments of inertia, radii of gyration. I'm not going to prove those today, so don't worry. All right? But I encourage you to prove them. The simplest case for parameterizations is when you have an integral, well, when, 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 the, when the surface involved is a graph. Okay? In other words, you can write the surface or parameterize the surface by z equals f of x, comma y, or in this case, I've used g. So all you do to parameterize is let x equal u, y equals v, and z equals g of u comma v. Now, in that case, and it's not difficult to show, you can show that the magnitude of the cross product of the tangent vectors is this um, mess here. Okay, so what you can do then is replace this in your surface integral with this. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, it's easier to compute partial derivatives. Okay, you can do it quickly rather than go through and, and work out a cross product and then find its magnitude. All right? All right. Notice also here I've subbed in for z so it's cause, because 
on the surface, z equals g of x. So I can put that in down here. All right. Compute the surface integral of the following function over the cap, the cap of the sphere. All right, so let's draw a little picture. There's the top hemisphere of our sphere. And for z greater than or equal to 2, that's, that, that, that's, that circle there is the intersection of the hemisphere with the plane z equals 2. Okay? So what we're looking at here is the following. This is our cap. This little top part here. Okay, it's a little bit off-center. I'm sorry about that. All right. So, notice here we can rearrange this equation for our surface into uh, an equation where z's a subject. All right. So, we parameterize our cap by the following. Okay, so, so that's going to be my g of x here. What's the parameter domain? Well, it's just... The disk here that lies below, I guess, the, the disk that lies in the plane z equals 2. All right, so So this shaded region here and that shaded re region here are the same. All right. Now, when z equals two, so this is the this is the z equals two. All right. You can put that back in in here, and you'll get um, the circle with radius root five. Okay, so this circle in the x or this um, disk in the xy plane is basically bounded by this this circle. All right, so our parameter domain here is just x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to five. All right, so what do we need now? We need the partial derivatives of g. Okay, so we've got our g. We just calculate dg dx and dg dy. Okay, so dg dx is going to be something like this. Okay, dg dy is going to be similar. So now we can put all these expressions together, this dg, dx, dg, dy, square them, add one, add them together, and take the square root. Okay? Now I'm just going to conserve space here. So I'm going to make a subscript, g sub x, for the derivatives. All right, if you square them, add, add these things together, you'll get the following. Okay. So now, yes? 
No, because the square root comes down, right? So that when the square root comes down, the two on the bottom will... Yep. Okay, so um, the last thing we need to do is go back to our f. We haven't used f yet. And in, replace z with g of x. Now, that's going to simplify a lot here. In fact, this, bot, this um, denominator is just going to become a constant. Okay? And when we square this, the square root sign is going to um, disappear. So, f of x, y, g of x, y. All right, what's that going to be? That's, uh, after some calculations, you'll get the following. Okay, I've skipped some steps because I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, really. <laughs>